Welcome to another lively edition of the Deadly Experiment to All. This week, part two of the excursion we took last week on the whole subject of kings of modern-day Israel here in America and this world system and the election farce of 2016. Last week, of course, we got into the scriptural basis for what is taking place in the United States now, the collapse of her economy, their collapse of the political system in the sense that uh, we have now been reduced to uh, an absurd choice for president, as it were. Uh, we have no choice, folks. The whole business of the White House, of the executive branch, Congress even, and the Supreme Court is a done deal. <clears throat> that is, it is in the hands of the powerful, the elite, the uh, synagogue of Satan, as we've referred to it, those who control the political process through an intricate web, an intricate web of various organizations controlling the media, controlling the political structure of the parties, and making sure that no independent could ever attain the White House again. Now, you know, we saw this in the past, going back a number of years. And I want to, right now, before I explain to you what I'm talking about in terms of precedent for eliminating presidents from the White House who threaten this new world order, as it's called, let me give you Brother Nathaniel. Brother Nathaniel is a convert from Judaism to Christ, and he went through, literally through a, a hell on earth trying to do that because of the hatred and the anti-Semitism of the Jewish religion, of Judaism, of Zionism, of Talmudism, and the hatred for Christ. It was a burden upon him, but that burden came from above. Christ touched his heart. He left, Catholic, he left uh, Judaism, yeah, Catholicism, basically the same thing today. And uh, he turned his back on uh, those who turned his, their backs on Christ, the synagogue of Satan. And now he is a Christian. We don't agree with all of his theology, nor his terms, you know, about Jews. Because what we talk about on this program is those who call themselves Jews and are not but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. These are these Kenites we talk about, sons of Cain from Adam and Eve. Remember, Cain murdered his brother Abel, the first murder in the Adamic world, this age and the Adamic world. Now, God created all the races separate and equal, so to speak, and then he created Epha Ahadam, which means the man Adam. Adam means to show blood in the face, in the cheeks, okay? It is ruddy complexion. That's what Adam means, literally translated from the Hebrew. So we have the white race, or the Caucasian Israelite people of the Bible today, all amongst us here in America, which is the unwalled city that the prophet spoke about in the end times, unwalled as opposed to Jerusalem, city of Antichrist. That's a walled city right now. But we are the Israel of God here in America, and Israel is under a curse today. The curse of Canaan, the curse of disobedience, disobedience to God Almighty, the Father in heaven. We've rejected him. Instead, our nation's in bed with the synagogue of Satan. All of the candidates for Congress, all of the presidential candidates, folks, are all saying the same thing. They would rather worship Israel, the state, rather than Israel and her God here in America. All of them are bought and paid for. All of them basically stand for that state and not stand up for America. Yes, the Israel that perpetrated the attacks on 9-11 here in America that cost the lives of almost 3,000 innocents. Can you imagine that? This is not. This is not something we conjure up. This is something that we'll show you in the weeks ahead. We've shown you before the connection to the Likud party in Israel and the taking over of the leases, 
from the New York Port Authority, transferring them into private hands, the murder of Americans on 9-11. And yet the media knew it. They wouldn't report it. None of the media will ever deviate from that agenda because they are owned lock, stock, and microphone by the same political entities which control this nation today. It says so in the Bible. It also says that Jerusalem is no longer the city flowing with milk and honey. The prophet Jeremiah says God will send his curse upon that city. He says so in Jeremiah 7. He actually comes out and tells us what will befall that city. He said, I make this house the house like Shiloh, and it will make, I will make this city, he says, Jerusalem, a curse to what? All of the nations of the world, and it is a curse today. World terror, fake terror, as we've seen in Brussels, and we've seen in Paris, orchestrated terror to convince a police state apparatus to come into be in Europe to control and monitor our thoughts. All of this is happening before our very eyes. A police state is erecting here in America to keep us safe, safe from those who are the perpetrators of crime. Not one presidential candidate would even broach the subject. Why? Because they know it's the kiss of death from the powers that be if they were to tell you the truth. I've shown you, as you see behind me, I'm in a cave right now, I've shown you the captivity right here from the word of God of Elijah, Elijah the prophet, who was preaching the truth of God's wrath to come upon his people because of their disobedience. And Ahab sent out his agents to get him 50 at a time, 200. He sent one legion, another legion, to get him, and God struck them down with fire from heaven because he prayed to God, the God above, Yahweh Yeshua, the real God, not the fake gods of the universe, the gods of Balaam. So when you have his protection, no one can touch you. No one can harm you. Nothing can come close because he has his divine fire protection upon you. Yes, God is a consuming fire, and he protects from the fires of this earth. The fire that he protected those three Hebrew boys in under Nebuchadnezzar. So you see, folks, all of the candidates are owned one way or another, lock, stock, and barrel, right now, candidates for the presidency by the same clique, the cabal. Right now, Brother Nathaniel will show us why. Trump's the ace of spades in the election game. And with a full deck of Jews in his royal flush, he can play to win. It all started with Trump's father, whose apparent ties with New Jersey real estate mogul Murray Kushner got the business going. Donald's daughter is now married to Jared Kushner and turned Jewish to get him. With skyscrapers in his high rising mind, young Donald set his sights on Manhattan where Jewish sharks can send you packing. So he hired the well-connected and mobbed up Roy Cohn, a notorious Jewish homosexual, as legal counsel. Smart move, Donald, for without a high-powered Jewish lawyer in Jaime Town, you might as well fold up. It's the place where Jewish business and organized crime meet, and Cohn knew just how to shuffle the cards. Trump's all in now since all those connections Cohen brought in keep the ante high. You don't become a Manhattan real estate mogul without seeding the kosher pot. Donald's Inn now includes Alan Weisselberg as CFO and Michael Cohen as legal boss. No lightweights here when dealing with the sharks. Trump knows how Jaime Town works. I think Schumer who I'm very close to Israel, but Schumer comes from New York, very close. I have a great relationship, far better than our president has, that I can tell you, but who doesn't? I think Schumer did it with a wink. Not a bad guy, smart guy. He used to be a friend of mine until I did this, and I said, look, all bets are off. Look, I got to do what I have to do. I'm sorry. 
But I'll be able to get along with these people. You know, you got to be able to get along. You got to make deals. We can't always sign executive orders. The country wasn't based on executive orders. I mean, you got to get deals. So I pretty much believe, I mean, I really know the New York City. I think they gave Schumer a little wave off. They said, look, you go ahead, oppose it. And this way you're friendly. And he has a large Jewish constituency, to put it mildly, the largest. To put it very mildly, if Trump becomes pres, there's going to be lots of Jewish IOUs called in. You got to make those deals. Take Carl Icahn, who bailed Trump out of his Taj Mahal bankruptcy. Hi, Donald. Carl Icahn here. Happy Passover, Carl. What can I do for you? Since it's Passover, I'm releasing you from that added loan. And by the way, I'm in a deal that involves Israel and need your help. Name it, Carl, and I'll get it done. And BB can surely help Trump make it happen. What do you think of the president's attitude towards Israel? Is he a friend of Israel? No, I think he's one of the worst things that's ever happened to Israel. You look at what's going on, and I know, I know Bibi very well. In fact, I, he asked me if I do a commercial for him. I think I'm the only so-called celebrity that did a commercial for him. And, uh, you know, and it was a nice commercial and everything else, and I hope he's going to do great, and I think he's going to do great. But when you think about it, and, and I have so many friends of mine that contributed to the Obama campaign, I said that because they're so pro-Israel, I said, how can you contribute to the campaign? This guy is the worst thing that ever happened to Israel. If Obama giving Israel $3 billion a year is the worst thing that ever happened to Israel, then imagine what Trump will do. Trump's ready to draw. But will the right cards ever come that will free us from Tel Aviv? Well, isn't that something, huh? Brother Nathaniel has it right about Trump, and you thought he would stand up for the Palestinians, for the American government, for the American people over that state in the Middle East? Uh-uh. He wouldn't even be allowed to breathe another week if he were to do that. And that's the joke, friends. It's on us. The yoke is on all of us. Let's go back now in history to see how these things have evolved just in the previous century. In the 20th century, we had a president who was probably in this century past one of the best presidents we ever had. And his name was Warren G. Harding. <laughs> yeah, you heard me right. The same president of the administration that was alleged to have been involved in scandal after scandal, corruption after corruption, he was, in fact, doing things to upset this powerful elite out of Jerusalem, even before Jerusalem was actually declared to be a city based upon the sovereignty, if you will, of the state of Israeli. That's right. He was opposing the policies of Woodrow Wilson, whom he succeeded, 1920. He died, very interestingly enough, and very conveniently, in the summer of 1923. He was the 29th president of the United States, Warren Harding. What was he doing? Well, one of the things he was doing, in his first State of the Union address, he actually spoke against the evils of Woodrow Wilsonism. That is, the idea of internationalism, interventionism, globalism, involvement in world wars. We had just come out of World War I, and 250,000 Americans gave their lives in that war. It was called the Rich Man's War, the war to end all wars, we were told, to spread democracy across the globe. And as uh, Professor Dan Smoot said in his analysis, nowhere in our Declaration of Independence Anywhere in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution itself is the word democracy to be found, nor is there to be found a genesis for the concept of spreading democracy. Because the founders of the Constitution and the framers were opposed to democracy because democracy means mob rule. They supposedly gave us a republic a rule of law based on democratic principles, though not a democracy. In fact, they knew that a democracy always represented a transitional form of government to tyranny. 
Now we are an empire. Democracy leads to empirism, as it did in the case of Rome, ancient Rome, imperial Rome. Well, Warren G. Harding spoke out against it, was trying to reverse the policies of Woodrow Wilson and the disaster of World War I. Little did he know that in just another decade or so, we'd be involved in another disastrous worldwide war, which saw the enslavement of one half of Europe to communism, barbarism, genocide as never before. Well, Harding didn't like the idea of meddling, world meddling as it's called. People like General Smedley Butler, also a hero of uh, World War I, spoke out against World War II on the eve of World War II. He suddenly died a very mysterious and untimely death. In the case of President Harding, he was also doing something very interesting with regard to the Bolsheviks taking over the government of the United States under Wilson. Remember, in 1921, the Rockefellers, who were agents of the Rothschilds in Europe, were planting the seeds of the Council on Foreign Relations, known as the Invisible or Shadow Government. Council on Foreign Relations is a, an appendage of the Rothschild banking system in Europe. It controls the foreign and domestic policies of the United States through its ancillary organizations like the Committee for Economic Development and so forth. Its goal is to promote socialism, Marxism, Leninism, and collectivism across the globe. And those are the things that Bernie Sanders proudly stands for. But then again, what would we expect from someone of his ilk? So, folks, Warren G. Harding was starting to move America back to neutrality, America back to independence from the one world system. His um, Justice Department was beginning to rout out Bolsheviks. And it was coming upon his third year in office that um, suddenly he became ill. Oh, the autopsy report showed that he died of a, of a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, or a stroke, actually, and that he was ill on the train to San Francisco, where he was uh, headed for his uh, particular political activities. In any event, interestingly enough, his death also signaled a change once again in foreign and domestic policies. That ended Warren G. Harding's chance to take America back. Calvin Coolidge, of course, was his successor, Herbert Hoover. Then we went right into the Rushevelt era, Franklin Delano Rushevelt, as he was called, fraudulent deficit Rushevelt, who set America on a revolutionary stage, a turning point toward the debacle which we now find ourselves in today. The super state, the fascist state, the communist state, where government is virtually all-powerful. All right, the point is Warren Harding tried to do something and he died in office. He was also, by the way, never, never convicted of anything because he died. He actually died before the so-called Teapot Dome scandal was broke, if you will, you know, before it became newsworthy, after his death. Then we have the case in more recent times of George Wallace. Now, George Wallace was, as you know, making inroads into the presidential campaign. It was 1972. President Nixon was president of the United States at that time, running for re-election. Wallace was beginning to make massive inroads in primary after primary, threatening, as a Democrat, threatening the power structure of the elite in Washington. No, he was not a racist. He was someone who represented states' rights over the federal government. In fact, he actually had more blacks working in his administration in Alabama than uh, many of the governors in the South of his time. So, in any event, what happened was when he was, as we know, winning primary after primary, George Wallace actually was nearly assassinated in Laurel, Maryland, I believe, by a man who was named as Arthur Bremer. Four bullets in Laurel, Maryland, severely wounded and crippled the presidential candidate, governor of Alabama. As it turned out, we were investigating, um, some of us independently, 
who this Arthur Bremer was. Turned out he was unemployed, had no job, but plenty of money to travel across the country and follow George Wallace in rally after rally. Well, as it turned out, a man named Timothy Heinen, who was working for the Milwaukee uh, Police Department investigating the activities of this Bremer, was making the claims that were later highly substantiated that it was the CIA that pulled the trigger through Arthur Bremer that gunned down George Wallace. George Wallace could not have been elected president because he would have begun the process of decentralizing government. And that's the last thing the sons of Cain want. They need to build a super state in a one world system where America is reduced as a nation, but its government has grown astronomically as we see today. Big government, police state activities to keep us safe, we're told. All of it, of course, is nothing but as uh, one man, Henry Ford, used to say, bunk. <laughs> well, then, of course, we saw the uh, arising of, of the, um, well, of uh, some of the others who came along with independent parties. Uh, Ross Perot comes to mind when he was beginning to make inroads. He also experienced death threats, eliminating him, essentially, from establishing a third party. But Ron Paul, in most recent times, we saw the candidacy of Ron Paul emerge in the election of 2012. And that was the first time I had voted in many, many years because we were on that bandwagon trying to prove a point that Ron Paul was the only candidate who was actually capable of making inroads into changing America's disastrous foreign policies in the Middle East following the Israeli hit on us on 9-11. Well, he was besmirched and smeared and vilified. In the words of Chuck Todd from NBC, I wish he would just go away. Poll after poll on MSNBC was showing Ron Paul leading. They shut down the poll twice. Shut it down because he was winning the presidential popularity poll, particularly very popular with the young and college students. Well. He was smeared out of office. I remember this uh, Kenite by the name of Baxt, M. Charles, who wrote for the Providence Journal, and how he particularly took a sneering uh, view of Pat Buchanan because of his Christian views and his views on America first and not Israel. And I remember that he used the occasion of uh, Pat Buchanan purportedly making the statement regarding the Mexicans coming into America. That illegally that uh, Trump has made. And Baxter wrote, um, hey, he referred to Pedro, and he referred to Pedro, you're not welcome here, go home. Well, in the mind of Mr. Baxter, of course, that was considered to be a racial epitaph. Coming from someone like Bax, that's quite a mouthful. In any event, I remember the smears that followed in the columns and the papers and all of the national media going after uh, Pat Buchanan. Ron Paul, Pat Buchanan, all of them. I skipped from Ron Paul to Pat Buchanan because of time to make the, the whole point that no matter who it is, no matter which party it is, anyone who emerges as a potential candidate who threatens this Kenite mob and the Cosa Nostra, as it is called, will be either assassinated, literally, or assassinated politically. Time and again that has been the case. Time and again it has been done. So we have seen that the Ron Pauls and the Patrick Buchanans and others who at some way, in some point, constituted some threat to the Cosa Nostra. Now all of them had Kenites in their campaign. Pat Buchanan had a number of them. Ron Paul had a number of them. He pulled out of the race, as we know, and he took all the money from people who had supported him, but then pulled out very interestingly enough. Folks, the gig is up. There is no possibility of us saving what is our nation, so we think, from this beast system of revelation. Right here in this Word of God, the Bible tells us what will befall us in the end times.
Building a wall will not solve a problem. Number one, there is no independent America left. America is part of the New World Order, economically, financially, politically, militarily. We are extended across the globe with 800 military bases. America is ancient Rome in modern times. It is collapsing from within and being destroyed by its own leaders who are serving their masters in Jerusalem. Now the Bible told us this would happen. If we understand how to read this word of God, we understand where America is now in Bible prophecy and where the world is. Friends, the world is going the way of a one world beast system. The beast system is a political beast. That will fail bringing Europe, America, and all of the continents under a one-world police state is the goal. That's why you have fake terror in Brussels. You have a, an airport terror that, again, the security of the airport in Brussels happened to be run by the Israeli Mossad. Now, wouldn't you know it? They just happened to be in charge of security in Brussels, as they were in Paris, as they were in Boston at Logan Airport when these planes purportedly left Logan and headed toward the Twin Towers. How is it that they're all connected to that same city, the city of the end times? Because the Father has told us this through his word. So, we've had election farce after election farce. We've had the same thing happen here in Rhode Island. One candidate after another promising us change. And friends, I've been around for, well, I guess I could say for 40 years I've been doing, you know, listening to talk radio, reading the rag sheets and all of the other papers. And guess what? It's only gotten worse. The 38 Studios debacle, well, that, of course, was Kacheri's work. And then we, we now have Gina Raimondo doing the same thing. Her friends on Wall Street are the same Cosha Nostra bosses that we've been talking about all along. It's her buddies that profit from Rhode Island taxpayers, and you pay the bill. So we go from one extreme to another, and it goes from the toll tax, uh, the truck toll tax uh, law situation now that is now implemented in Rhode Island, will not even take effect for a number of months to come. And uh, now, of course, the, the video about uh, Rhode Island advertising its tourism values, its business qualities. Folks, the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's nothing new under the sun, it says in the Word of God. Focus on Him. Focus on Christ, and you can be free in Him in these last times. It's not going to get better. We're heading toward destruction, my friends. Physically, economically, spiritually, and this is the death of the soul in this age that we're seeing. Time's up. We're just about out of time. In the remaining moments, again, we'd like to tell you these programs will be run again so that you can see them. This is part two of the program on kings and elections in 2016. Don't place your trust in men or political parties. Put your faith and trust in him up above. Thank you for joining us on The Deadly Experiment. Rick Adams, your producer and host, reminding you that God protects serves his children. Most of all, may he bless his elect.